GIP 17A, the, quote, Madness in Bada Chandran's Paintings, Part 1. This lecture, which will be fairly long and in two parts, is about one of the two great individualist artists of the early Qing China, that is Bada Shunran, who was born in 1626 and died in 1705. The other of the two is, of course, Shi Tao, who was the subject of the sixth lecture in this series. Other major individualist artists of this period, such as Kun San or Shi Qi and Hung Ren, maybe Gong Shan, I mean to do lectures on those also. Bada Shanran means something like eight great mountains and uh, mountain man. And it's one of the names that he took for himself. His proper name was Zhu Da. Uh, like Shi Tao, he was a distant member of the Ming imperial family, the Jews. And he, uh, his life was put in jeopardy after the fall of the Ming in 1634 while, while he was still a child, since the conquer conquering Manchus suspected all surviving members of the imperial clan as of possible subversion, efforts to restore the fallen dynasty. So both artists became Buddhist monks, and they both took new names. Zhu Da left his ancestral home in Nanchang, Jiangxi province, and he became a Buddhist monk, and eventually the abbot of a temple. In 1630, uh, upset by the departure of his principal patron, the, he went mad, or he pretended madness. Uh, prominent people in China sometimes do this just to avoid punishment. The question of whether he was really mad or pretending madness is a large and unsolved one in Bada Shanran's studies, and is part of the subject of my lecture. Next, uh, first image, please. One of the leading scholars of Bada Shanran's studies was Wang Feng Yu, whom I've introduced before in my lectures. I knew him first as Fred Wong, a Yale professor, who among other things was working on a computer program that could compose Chinese classical style poetry on its own. Good meter and rhyme, that is, if even if very short on good sense. He was also a collector of paintings, especially those by two artists, Chi Baishir and Bada Shanran. After his death, his entire Bada collection went to the Freer Gallery as a gift from his family. But his Bada studies culminated in 1989 with an exhibition that he organized with Dick Barnhart, seen with him here, and a catalog in which Wang Feng Yu wrote a very valuable biographical essay on the artist, while Dick Barnhart contributed one about his paintings as the art historian of the pair. The exhibition, shown first at Yale University, was also shown at San Francisco, at the Asian Art Museum, and I conducted a graduate seminar in which, among other things, I tried to collect all the available reproductions of his works and catalog them into more or less datable order and studied them in this way with my students. But this was after the great International Bada Shanran Symposium that took place in Nanchang, presumably Bada's birthplace, in October 1986. Next. Wang Feng Yu is seen here again with myself and others as a, in a different symposium that happened later. I can't unfortunately show you any photos of the 1986 Bada Shanran Symposium and its participants because I didn't make any. I made hundreds of slides of the great exhibition of his paintings held at the Qingyun Pu, a Taoist temple outside the city that was believed to have been where he lived. But that turned out to be based on a perhaps mistaken identification of him with a certain Zhu Daolong, who had been a monk at that temple. I'm not going to try to relate the arguments about Bada's association with that temple and with Nanchang. They are too complex, and you can read them elsewhere. We were taken to see a local opera based on Bada's life, much fictionalized. We were taken also to a recreation of his supposed home at the Qingyunpu, where one could look through a window to see his study. The Chinese are fond of such recreations, just as the Japanese insist on preserving the originals of historic places and objects. A statue of Bada, based on a portrait that I'll show later, stands nearby. Next. One famous and fascinating scholar who came to the symposium was Rao Zhengyi, whom I had come to know from previous symposia and meetings, 
and who always had original and important contributions to make. It was he who, after we had been taken on a tour of the city, made an academic joke that broke everybody up. A certain bridge we had gone over had on it the four bronze characters for Ba Yi Da Chao, Eight One Great Bridge, presumably commemorating some local political event that happened on the first of the eighth month, Ba Yi. Rao Zengyi's proposal was that they switch the second and third characters so that it would read Bada Yi Chao, or One Bada Bada Shan Ran Bridge. Good joke. Good jokes like that sometimes stick in the mind long after one has forgotten most of the scholarly papers, or at least that's true of me. Next. My paper written for this symposium, titled The Madness in Bada Shan Ran's Paintings, was translated into Chinese by my grad students and delivered at the symposium by my good friend, haha, <laughs> my good friend Blank, his name escapes me. It'll come back, but anyway. Uh, anyway, he taught Chinese art history at the Nanjing Painting Academy. He's the far left figure in this group photo taken on one of my visits to Nanjing. But my paper was so long and difficult with lots of foreign names and hard words in it that he eventually broke down and couldn't continue. And next, please. My younger colleague, Wen Fong, saved the day by taking up the manuscript and continuing to read it, doing some abbreviating as he went along. It was very late at night. I was grateful to him for doing this, and I still am. Next. After the symposium, a few of us were taken on a trip by van to Mount Lu, north of Nanchang, close, closer to the Yangtze River. This is a photo taken from the top of Mount Lu. I showed some of these the, at the end of my third PRV lecture. Well, um, looking out over the river, as I say, with me on that trip were my good friend Takahiro Shindo and a Japanese girlfriend of his. He's the figure at right in this photo, which was taken after a different symposium, the one on Hungran. Next, one of the good guys, Danny Goldstein. He and his wife, Hillary, are psychiatrists at the Berkeley Therapy Institute, and they are both old friends and generous benefactors. He's helped me and my daughter Sarah in numerous ways, and I've had lots of great dinners and parties at his house and stayed in their guest house with Shingaran and our boys. Anyway, while the Bada Shanran Symposium was on in San Francisco, I took him on a tour of it and also gave him some readings on Bada and especially on the problem of his madness asking him to prepare to talk to my seminar about this. He did, having the whole seminar to a dinner and talking with us and answering questions afterwards. I'll come back to Danny and his talk later in this lecture. Next. I begin my article by giving the evidence for Bada's so-called madness. And note, please, that in my lecture title and in my article, I always put this word madness in quotation marks leaving open the question of whether or not he was really mad, whatever that means, as a question ultimately beyond resolution. The portrait of him at Wright was painted in 1674, when he was about 48. Among the inscriptions on it is a very revealing one by Bada himself. He was still a monk, as seen here, but, in, but a few years after this, uh, was, after this was painted, he gave up his Buddhist monkhood and lived as a secular painter for the rest of his life. He put a sign reading dumb, that is not speaking, on his door and never spoke again, only laughing and crying and waving his arms and behaving irrationally. But, as I say, we can't be sure whether he was truly mad or only acting mad. I discussed this question at some length in the opening section of my article, giving the evidence or indications that point in both directions, and concluding that his, quote, his derangement was too severe and lasting to be dismissed entirely as theatrical madness. The enactment of madness, moreover, I go on, could surely have aggravated whatever instability afflicted him already. As writers of Hamlet have pointed out, prolonged pretending of madness is, in effect, being mad, end quote. I wrote that at a time when we had living in our basement apartment a grad student in English, English lit, a friend of Sarah's, who was writing about the madness in Hamlet and other Shakespearean characters while teetering dangerously on the edge of madness himself, aggravated by drug use. Next. 
Later in my paper, in the final section, I um, discuss questions of mad artists as they have been dealt with in the West, notably in the 1922 book by the German psychotherapist Hans Prinzhorn, with the German title translatable as something like Artistry of the Mentally Ill. I also cite a book by Carl Jaspers, also published in 1922, titled Strindberg and Van Gogh, Van Gogh, however you pronounce it, in which he describes two kinds of relationships between madness and artistic production. The type represented by the playwright Strindberg, in which his, quote, productivity of literary works is wanting during the acute period of his mental illness, while almost all of his impressive works were written after that during the final phase, end quote, and the type represented by Van Gogh, in which the works, quote, grow during a stormy mental agitation with a marked tendency to a certain culmination. From that moment on, the pro process of disintegration gains strength. During the final phase, the creative ability ceases to function. And I point out that, quote, everything we know about the chronology of Otto Schoenrun's life and his paintings indicates that in his case, the relationship was of the former type with the period of greatest productivity following on the period of most severe mental disorder. The qualities of his paintings that we have tried to define as constituting the madness in them mostly appear only long after his period of serious derangement, and they develop together with, in fact are inseparable from, the qualities that made him a great painter. And the conclusion strongly suggested by all this is that Bada, in his best and strongest works, is not merely reflecting whatever disorder still afflicted him, but is drawing on remembered states of mental aberration to create the aberrant forms and structures of his paintings. One might adapt Wordsworth's famous formulation for poetry to speak of this as madness recollected in semi-sanity. We should not read the paintings then as symptoms of a mind incapable of tighter control but as creations of a mind deliberately opened to unfamiliar areas of human experience and able to impress something of the character of that experience on other minds through the power of artistic images." End quote. Wow, that's pretty impressive if I do say it on myself. Uh, has it been accepted by others in Bada studies or argued against? Answer, neither. It's been ignored, like so much of my other writings. A woman student of Dick Barnhart's published an article citing mine as wrong-headed, but misquoting it, leaving out the quotation marks around madness in my title and sentences, and generally missing the point. I had to write a response to be published in the next issue of Archives, edited by Dick Barnhart, gently setting her right. She now teaches Chinese art history in one of our great universities. Next, please. I have a long paragraph on types of madness in artists from the late 15th century when artists like Wu Wei, Wu Xiaoxin, ad quote, adopted stances of professional madness that gave them a privileged position in the society, exempting them from cer certain normal requirements of conformity and allowing them to project attractive bohemian personae. Painters of this group behaved strangely and took names for themselves that featured such words as quang or crazy, dian or insane, and chu or idiot. And I give examples, beginning with Wu Wei, a section of whose Fisherman Hand Scroll, a painting that I once owned myself, is now on the screen. Next, please. By the late 16th century, I continue, the time of Xu Wei, 1525 to 96, a truly psychotic artist who mutilated himself killed his wife, and failed tragically to accommodate to even minimal social requirements, spending much of his later life in states of inebriation and derangement, it was difficult to find new terms or new expressive forms for madness so as to extricate oneself from the conventions. Xu Wei, in fact, for all his brilliant originality, conforms in some respects to the patterns set by his professionally mad predecessors. The subject he paints and the ways in which he portrays them are not in themselves especially strange. It is only in the vehemence and the unrestraint of his brushwork that we can sense some formal counterpart.
to his recorded madness. I'm showing first a section of a scroll of landscape of figures, and then one section of his great hand scroll of fruits and flowers in the Nanjing Museum. We'll have a separate lecture on Xu Wei. Next. In Bada Shonran's works, by contrast, I continue, the oddness of the brushwork affects us less in the end than the unsettling oddness of his imagery. He has found, that is, a way around the conventions. We will consider these two aspects of Bada's paintings in succession. In this lecture, I'll be showing more works uh, by Bada than I could in the published paper and abbreviating the text of the paper. So those of you who are seriously interested in the subject can still read the paper. The text of it, without any illustrations, can be found on my website, jamescahill.info, as CLP12. Here is one of Bada's odd album leaves, in which he puts together imagery that is ordinarily kept separate in Chinese painting. A quail, which also stands on one leg, as if off balance, and looks upward as creatures in Bada's paintings commonly do, and is accompanied by two small fish. The Yale student who misquoted my paper in trying to criticize it was herself making an argument for interpreting one of Bada's paintings of this kind in the light of an early text by a Zhou period philosopher, as I recall, that similarly juxtaposed odd creatures. I wrote in my response that for every viewer who recognized this esoteric allusion, there must have been ten or so who simply gazed at the odd picture as, quote, another work by that crazy artist Bada Shanran, or something like that. And I still believe that. Next. Bada's earliest works, the 1660 album in the National Palace Museum, Taipei, and a few others with the same signature, are relatively ordinary in their subjects. Their oddness is chiefly in their composition, and especially in the device of pushing the object portrayed to the edge or even beyond the frame, so that only part of it is seen. It's as though someone had made a photograph while aiming the camera in slightly the wrong direction. Another oddity is Bada's use of rectilinear stalks and branches to divide the composition geometrically into interesting shapes. These compositional devices are rarely seen in earlier painting but are common in Bada's. Next. Brushwork in Bada's middle period paintings continues to be relatively controlled and static and is characterized by flat, square-ended strokes. Even when this gives way to the more impassioned and idiosyncratic brush manner of his later years, control is not really relaxed, and the effect is never the explosive unrestraint of some of Xu Wei's paintings. Her Xu Wei engages in forceful gestures so that his brush configurations seem to expand their energy outward into the surrounding space. Bada compresses the energies of his brushwork within more cohesive and self-contained forms. I'm showing here a great painting of Lotus in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which Bada inscribes as after Xu Wei. I'll bring it back later with lots of details. Next. In the later works, these tend to be more rounded forms, and in the landscapes, such as this one in the Stockholm Museum, they are often bulbous, as though distended by pressure from within. I'll show a few more landscapes and details from landscapes by Bada to illustrate this point later. The tension between activated, uncouth brushstrokes, which in extreme cases attain the quality that one writer has called brush delirium, and the contours or edges that enclose them and prevent the release of the forces they generate is a significant source of the power of some of Bada's best works. And it's an effect that we inevitably associate with what we read about his repressed psychological state, his inability or unwillingness to express his thoughts and emotions in speech, the sense of pent-up passions felt by those who met him. This is in contrast to Xu Wei's unrestrained outbursts of violent and destructive actions, and the fervent, more accessible expressiveness of Xu's writings. The contrast is between two very different personalities, and it appears to be reflected in their paintings. For Xu Wei, it's typically a sense of exuberance and release that we feel. For Bada, a powerful urge to expression, working against equally powerful constraints. Quote, 
In his innermost being, he was at once wildly ebullient and melancholy, writes his contemporary Xiao Chong Hung about him. Quote, in addition to this, he was unable to relax and seemed like a river bubbling up from a spring that is blocked by a large stone or like a fire smothered with wet wool. Thus deprived of an outlet, he would start raving at one moment and fall silent the next, end quote. Next. Continuing with Bada's compositional oddities, he constructs compositions in which solids cannot easily be distinguished from spoids. Spatial relationships are unclear, and the function of contour lines ambiguous. He will distort the scale so that a huge lotus is made to tower like a tree over a dwarfed water bird. Next. He will shift suddenly the relationship of viewer to subject, so that after observing two birds in a bare tree close up in the first half of a hand scroll, we find ourselves abruptly looking at a landscape from a distance in the second half, with no softening transition between. Next. Creatures in Bada's paintings often look upward, as if apprehensively, fearful of some danger from above, like Chicken Little in our fairy tale, afraid that the sky is falling down. Next. Birds and fish make up the most common subjects in Bada's paintings, apart from his landscapes. And if we ask what these have in common as motifs in art, the answer is that both represent the concept of freedom. Neither birds nor fish are restricted by gravity to lateral movement on the Earth's surface, as are animals and humans. Both fish and birds move fluidly in three-dimensional worlds, darting up and down or sideward at will, in a state of perfect union with their unbounded environments. The dream of escaping the confines of Earth-bound existence by becoming a bird or a fish is a constant among human fantasies, and traditional pictures of these subjects played on that universal dream. Bada Shanran, whose personal situation made the wish for escape especially poignant, evokes the ideal in many of his pictures only to undermine it. For his creatures, as for himself, there is no congenial environment and no way out. Next. The birds are usually roosting or sleeping or otherwise grounded and often seem oddly heavy, exhibiting no inclination to take wing. The fish sometimes appear motionless and sullen, as if pondering some predatory action. Bada's creatures, that is, appear charged with attitudes and emotions that one doesn't ordinarily attribute to birds and animals. Next. Comparison with Sung period portrayals of the same subjects is revealing, where a quail and a Sung painting exist in an unconscious rapport with its surroundings, as seen in this one by the Southern Sung Academy master, Leon Jung, Bada's quails are somehow ill at ease and apprehensive as they look upward at the overhanging bank. Next. Where fish in a Sung painting are at one with their watery world and totally absorbed in their supple movement, Bada's fish seem suspended in space and often wear menacing or glowering expressions that suggest a certain disharmony or rupture with their environments. Next. It was common in Tsung paintings to uh, depict birds in pairs, and so suggest by their poses some kind of silent communication between them. Bada typically refers to this convention only to subvert the idea of rapport that it usually signified. His paired birds are more likely to look in different directions, like two people pointedly ignoring one another. Sometimes one sleeps while the other peers about. They are related compositionally, but not by any sense of mutual awareness. Next. Conversely, creatures are sometimes isolated in large, blank fields of space as images of existential aloneness. For a small fish, this may seem a natural and unthreatening state. But for the chick, portrayed in one leaf of the Shanghai Museum album of 1694, so newly out of its shell that it still retains the shape of the egg, the absence of any supportive environment is cause for anxiety. It huddles unprotected, fearful of what the world holds for it, looking apprehensively upward, again like Chicken Little in our story. Next. Bada's creatures often gaze upward in this way, imparting a vague sense of foreboding to the pictures. Some of them only roll their eyes upward, 
but others twist their heads and crane their necks as if concerned or alarmed by something above them. The motif is so common in Bado's paintings that we must suppose it held some special significance for him. A deer looks up into a cedar tree in one painting, and in another watches a bird flying overhead. In one of his pictures, two strange birds, which the inscription identifies as peacocks, although the casual observer might mistake them for turkeys, look intently out from the picture's face. Next. This, too, is a departure from the usual. Birds and traditional paintings were concerned only with what was within the frame, but precedent can be found in the work of Chan Hong Shou, for instance, in this detail from one of his paintings that I reproduced in making this point as figure 4.27 in my compelling image book in the chapter on Chan Hong Shou. Bada Shanran must have known some of Chan Hong Shou's paintings and adopted a few of his ideas, although virtually nothing of his style. Next. Related in effect to the gazing upward theme, is the threatening overhang, a common motif in Bada's works, which renders the compositions unstable and the situations of the creatures below insecure. Even when we recognize that the rocks are meant to be solidly based on the riverbank and the fish swimming in the water, the feeling persists that the fish are somehow at risk. Instead of being comfortably enclosed in its environment, a creature in Bada's paintings may appear trapped by it. The shapes of the creatures are often distorted. A misshapen rabbit at left, a strangely geometricized cat at right. One cannot claim Bada as a close observer of nature, as one could for Sung artists who portrayed animals and birds. Rather, he endows them with consciousness and seeming personalities, uses them for expressions more of his inner self than of his observation of the world around him. Next. Bada's birds are often oddly lumpy, not the smoothly organic forms we were used to seeing in nature and in earlier Chinese paintings. They often perch on one leg, as they do in nature, but are made to seem off balance. The effect is a sense of alienation, a denial of the familiar. Next. Creatures turn away from the viewer as if revealing a desire for withdrawal, an inward or antisocial temperament. Chan Hung Shou in the late Ming had frequently depicted human figures facing away from the viewer or partly hidden for similar effect, although it might be difficult to imagine that the ex same expression could be given to plants, Bada accomplishes, accomplishes it by having flowers turn away from the viewer or by hiding blossoms behind leaves so that only part of them were glimpsed, as in many of his lotus pictures. Next. Here's a painting of grapevines by Bada Shanran and a detail from it showing how he uses the leaves of the grapevine to hide the bunches of grapes behind. This, of course, is just the opposite of, next please, of what a Sung period artist would do, as we see in this late Sung painting of grapes brought back from one of the PRV lectures. The question of how much Bada knew of Sung period Chan or Zen painting, which may have been passed down in Buddhist monasteries, even though it doesn't appear on the surface, so to speak, that is in the collections and catalogs of major known collectors of the later periods. This question is one that I'll take up in part B of this lecture, which will be based on a Bada lecture that I gave at Yale while their great exhibition was going on. So I won't try to answer that question here. Next. A bird will look suspiciously over its shoulder, as if aware of being watched. Bada painted several pictures of this kind. The one at left is an example. The only precedent I know, an earlier painting, is a picture that's attributed to Mu Chi, but is best considered an anonymous late Sung work, the one at right. I showed it in my last PRV lecture as a painting ascribed to Mu Chi. Together with the Ruguan painting of grapes cited earlier and other comparisons that could be introduced, the similarity of this work to Bada's raises the interesting possibility of some separate transmission of Chan Buddhist imagery and symbolism within the Chan sect from the 13th century to the 17th, which permitted Bada to draw on a category of painting that otherwise is known only from examples preserved in Japan. As I said before, I'll treat this question in Part B of this lecture. Next. 
It might be argued, I continue in my old paper, that Bada is only revealing sharp powers of observation. Minor birds really strike such poses as these and appear sometimes unnaturally alert and thoughtful. I remember watching minor birds in cages while I was in Hong Kong and China and wishing I had photographed one of them doing this to use in talking about Bada's birds. But the issue of being observed, my paper continues, had special significance for Bada. He inscribed one of his paintings, quote, a solitary bird afraid that someone is looking at it, end quote. Birds in Chinese painting were ordinarily portrayed as unaware of being watched. They are absorbed in their own affairs, communing silently with each other, not with any observer. Next. Another odd pairing, this time two quail and a mouse atop a rock. My paper, my paper continues. With such observations as these, we can construct a kind of grammar and vocabulary for Bada Shunran's paintings, even though we cannot say with confidence what the words mean. And we can ident identify tentatively the issues that his paintings raise. Freedom, from con freedom versus constraints, alienation versus adjustment, inwardness versus sociability, a relationship of harmony or uh, disharmony with the surrounding world, the oppressiveness of consciousness, the possibility of communication and obstacles to it. All these seem congruent with Bada's own predicament. So, to return to our original question, what is there of madness in all this? Isn't it instead just a matter of a highly original mode of expression conveying deeply felt emotions? Before attempting an answer to that question, let us consider one last aspect of Bada's paintings, their unorthodox compounding of subjects. Chinese art artists and their audiences had reached general agreement over the centuries, not only about what subjects were suitable for painting, but also about how these were to be combined, cranes with pine trees, quail with grain, and so forth. But in this again, Bada refuses to abide by the rules and invents odd juxtapositions of images. Next. Quail can be combined with fish, as we saw before. An eagle, which had often been portrayed about to strike a smaller bird or a rabbit, appears in Bada's painting looking down at a crab. Birds of different species that do not seem to belong together are nevertheless placed together, like strangers who have nothing in common and feel uncomfortable in each other's company. Next. The juxtapositions can take the form of visual puns, as when a bird roosts on a stone that looks like an oversized egg, or a full moon or a moon cake is made to echo the shape of a melon. But these are exceptions. Bada's purposes are not usually so penetrable or so innocuous. Next. When the individual motifs have well-established meanings, as in a picture of hibiscus, lotus, and chrysanthemums, the knowledgeable viewer attempts to interrelate them and make sense of the combination. And when this proves impossible, the effect is subtly unsettling. Bada is constantly drawing on the long-established expectations of Chinese painting viewers and then working against them. Historians of Western art can think of parallels in European painting of the later period, or by aberrant artists such as Goya or Van Gogh. Next. Bada's hand scroll compositions in particular present as they unroll strange surprises, aberrations of pictorial syntax, ones that begins with swimming fish, ends with, sweep, with sleeping ducks. A painting of lotus and other flowers unexpectedly introduces a cat sleeping on a rock. One that features lotus and small birds in the first half presents a duck and a banana palm in the second. Examples could be multiplied. One is reminded of Bada's poems, which similarly force inexplicable leaps upon the viewer, or on the reader, I mean, one line failing to lead to another in any normal, discursive way. Next. I go on to note that an argument can be made for similar qualities with spatial incoherence, unbalance, and mismatching of elements in Bada's landscape paintings. And I note that when Bada's paintings are accompanied by poetic inscriptions, quote, the viewer is usually confronted by similar disjunctions between the picture and the inscriptions. One expects the text to explicate somehow the images, and instead it only compounds the puzzle. 
A consistent kind of calculated incoherence, in fact, characterizes all the relationships in his works, between images within the paintings, between paintings and poems, and between images or illusions within the poems. It is not that any of these, poems or paintings, seem merely to ramble aimlessly. The juxtapositions, like the images themselves, appear loaded with significance, so that one is led to search for intelligible meaning and fails to find it. We are not permitted even to know whether it is some hidden purpose or an incoherence of mind that underlies the discontinuities. We are unsure whether to read the paintings as deliberately cryptic expressions or as the products of a mind incapable of sustained rational functioning. But the paintings with their inscriptions open the latter possibility forcefully enough to allow us to speak of an effect of madness in Bada Shanran's works. End quote. So ends the main body of my paper. The conclusion that follows makes the arguments about types of madness and how they may be reflected in art. But I've already summarized that, however briefly, and I don't mean to spell out my arguments more fully in this video lecture. I would rather, rather urge those of you who are really interested to read the whole text of my article. You can find it unillustrated as CLP12 on my website, jamescahill.info, or you can look up the original publication of it, which was in the journal Asian Cultural Studies, published by Tokyo International University, as Tokyo Kokusai Daigaku, issue number 17 for March 1989, pages 119 to 43. Next. Here again is the photo of Danny Goldstein, the therapist and all-round good guy, who spent time looking into the problem of Bada's madness, then had my seminar and myself to dinner and gave us a valuable talk after dinner. He began by saying that he had shared all the information with another therapist, a woman named Margaret, Margaret Blank, I, the name escapes me, maybe I'll think of it later, uh, whom he considers to be the best diagnostician in the business. And they both had come to the tentative conclusion that what we know about Bada Shanran seems to them to indicate that he probably suffered from what's known as bipolar disorder, the disorder that once was called manic depressive, one of the two main types of mental disorders that therapists recognize, the other being schizophrenia. I want to elaborate on that statement, and I should add that another trained therapist, John McGregor, who lives in San Francisco, and with whom I had a long correspondence about Bada Shanran matters, doesn't agree. And that really is the end of this lecture. Part B will be based on a lecture I gave for Dick Bernhardt and his students and others at Yale while the exhibition was still on there. And it treats, among other things, how Bada's paintings of different periods fit into his biography, how some of his paintings seem to continue a Chan or Zen painting tradition, and what is the significance of that, and other big Bada topics. Together, the two parts will sum up much of what I have to say about this great individualist master, especially what I say that differs from what others have written about him. And that is the end of it. James Cahill, the end. Mm -hmm.